Um, we're going to be continuing in our series. It's part three today. And for a title, it's uh, Living in Godly Contentment. Living in Godly Contentment. And it's important to understand the power of contentment. It's important to understand the power of allowing God to be at the center of our lives. It's important to understand the power in the Lord's Prayer where he talks about, I will give you daily bread. It's important to understand that the baseline functionality of God's provision is daily bread and raiment. And if you have food and clothes, you should have contentment in your life. And I want to share this with you. The only way a believer does not have contentment in their lives is something is occupying the space of Jesus. Something is occupying the space of Jesus. Where Jesus should be, something else has moved in, and Jesus is our perfect peace. So if we keep him in the center and follow him, we're going to have this godly contentment I'm talking about. And, you know, we're going to see where Paul mastered this contentment while under house arrest, while in prison. And you got to think about back in those days, there was no toilets. You know, you, 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 there was no lights. Uh, so he's, he's using the restroom in his cell. He's, he, he, he's, he's, he can't shower. He can't do anything. But yet and still, he said, I've learned something here. In this horrible circumstance, I've learned something here. And he learned how to be contentment. And the thing, one of the things we've discovered in the Word of God, and just in studying the Word of God, one of the things that aggravates our contentment is when life is good and we want more. Life is good and we want more. In other words, we can't bask in the goodness of God because we are, we are filled with wanting more. Therefore, we can't see the house that we have is great. The car that we have is great. The family we have is great. The business I have is great. We want more. Now, I'm not, I'm not talking about goals. I'm not talking about plans. I'm talking about contentment, godly contentment, and there is a difference. Now, <clears throat> glory to God. <clears throat> you, as a believer, want to learn what Paul learned. You want to learn how to be content. You, you, you know, you, you, one of the quickest ways to learn how to be content is to realize, number one, you're not perfect. You are not a perfect parent. <laughs> you are not a perfect father. You are not a perfect mother. You are not a perfect businessman. You are not a perfect employee. You are not a perfect teenager. You are not a perfect child. But you are God's child. And you need to understand if you're going to be content, you got to know you can't drive. You got to allow God's peace, Jesus, to drive your life. And when you know that he's driving your life, you will employ this contentment and this peace that's going to allow you to live a life that you can really rejoice in. You know, so many times we rejoice with the events of life. When great things happen, we conquer something and, and we get favor here and we get favor there. You know, nothing wrong with that. But, 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 but don't train yourself to be a crisis-based uh, 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 Christian and don't train yourself to be a Christian who only, who only rejoices with God when something good happens to you. No, contentment says I rejoice every single day. Why? Because God gave me bread and God gave me raiment. God gave me clothing. God gave me the basic necessities of our, of our lives, of my life. Godly contentment, <clears throat> you write, write this down, godly contentment can mean not being battered around by difficult circumstances. Not being battered around like a pinball by different circumstances. Battered around by people and their attitudes. They're up, they're down. One day they're happy, next day they're, they're sad. One day they love you, next day they're talking about you. One day they lift you up, next day they're tearing you down. Godly contentment means, listen, you're not battered around by these people. And you're not battered around by this, the vicissitudes of life the vicissitudes of life. 
the unpredictable changes of life, you're not battered around by those vicissitudes when you understand that God is my source. So the economy can be up, the economy can be down. I can be married, I can be separated, I can be divorced. The, the, the kids are doing great, the kids are sneaking around. The kids are truthful, the kids are lying. Doesn't matter. You're not battered around by it. Why? Because you're living in godly contentment. And the vicissitudes, these unpredictable changes will happen in life. And the way to war against, to war against your soul being tormented and toiling over the next thing is to understand you got to be godly content. Listen, no one, when I was making my plans and goals in my 20s, preaching was, pastoring was not even in it. Think about that. And we can set goals and think that we're in contentment, but your goals are so, they can be so off if you haven't sought God. And, and I was reading something uh, this week where the people with six figures worth of student loan debt, six figures, those people are not even working in that field. You know why? Because ambition drove them to college. Goals drove them to college without consulting God. And now they discover at 30, 35, I'm not even doing the thing that the government wants me to pay for at 1200 bucks a month. Well, how in the world did that happen? I'll tell you how it happened. Ambition can aggravate contentment. And, I, you know, if I could do it all over again, if I could do it all over again, graduate from high school, full ride scholarship, if I could do life all over again, I'd do military for four years. I would do military for four years, come out, and go to school. I would do military for four years, come out of the military, and then, and, and then go to college. Because there were some basic disciplines I didn't have. And I was highly ambitious. I was highly uh, 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 just, just out of control, performance-driven. But I needed time. I needed a gap to find myself. That's why here in the church in Discover 612, we tell the teens, you got to discover who you are. you got to discover who God is. you got to discover your pathway with God. Why is that? Because you can go to school for four years and not even know why you're going. I'm highly convinced that children at 17 years old taking off to college, if they would just pause and say, you know what, I'm going to hang around with my parents and take my electives these first two years right here at home base. Why would you do that? Because I got to discover who I am and what I want. Because if I just take right off out of high school, I can go to school to be a doctor only to turn around eight years later and realize, no, I, I, I don't like this. I want to be a school teacher. Well, you, you got all the student loans now. And what, what, what happened? There was no contentment, but there was a lot of ambition. So I would even tell, I would even, I would even have my kids at 17 coming out of youth ministry, listen, seek God on what direction he wants you to take. Why? Because I know that if you don't have godly contentment, you're going to go off ambition, and you may, you may go off four years, eight years, master's, Ph.D., only to discover at 40, this was not for you. Amen? So godly contentment, the, un, the, the, the unpredictable changes uh, in life, the vicissitudes, you don't want to be battered around by those. Godly contentment can be wrongly seduced by prosperity. In other words, you get a raise, you get a promotion, you start a business, you get another client, you get another contract, and you say, oh, my God, I'm just so content. No, no, no. You're just seduced by increase. You're seduced by increase. And if we're not careful, this seduction, into, when we're seduced by increase, we think that we're living in godly contentment. But in actuality, the promotion, the, the, the increase, the, the, the advancement has become the God of your life. And if that, if that contract is pulled back, if those 10 clients pull back, Man, if that job pulls back on you, all of a sudden, you're not in peace. Why? Because you were seduced by, pros by prosperity. We're going to talk about this later on in the series. I am convinced that there are two things that every believer should be doing. Growing in God and giving. Growing in God and giving is going to bring peace. Growing in God and giving is going to bring godly contentment. Growing in God and giving is it's going to bring God to contentment. Why, why? What am I doing? I'm exalting God, and I'm denouncing the God of this world, that money, and letting it know God is my source. So I'm growing in God, and I'm giving. But I tell you what, if I stop giving, and I stop growing in God, I start reaching for other gods to appease me. I start reaching for, for, for careers and PhDs and attaboys to appease me. Why? Because I've abandoned 
God and I'm not growing in God and I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not giving. Giving, giving removes self. Giving removes that. And I'm telling you, a tremendous contentment comes over you. My wife, in the, in the, in the, in the, in the time that we have been married, We've known each other for over uh, 27 years. Has never come to me, can't come to me and said, let's stop giving. She has never questioned our giving. She has never questioned our sowing. Never, ever, never. And I'm so God, glad. Why? That's the goodness of of God in my life because that's a component that keeps my godly contentment in check. And if she's telling me not to give, employ this God, not to give, employ this savings, not to give, we got a big thing coming up because, no, 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 no. She doesn't do that. Why? She understands. Godly contentment comes from tremendous, tremendous conviction on growing in him and giving. And I'm here to tell you those two things you definitely want in your life. So we're not going to be battered around by people. We're not going to be battered around by circumstances. We're not going to be battered around and seduced by prosperity. Sometimes the greatest enemy to growth is growth itself. Why? Because when you start growing a business, when you start growing in your career, when you start learning a few things, all of a sudden you feel like, I don't need God. And you get seduced by prosperity and the giving goes down, the giving goes away. Why? Because now you don't feel like it takes all that. Your godly contentment has got to be anchored and growing in him and giving back to the Lord. So we don't want to be seduced by prosperity. How do I do that? Have your life centered in God. How do I avoid being seduced by prosperity? Have your life centered in God. Listen, I know a lot of people who call themselves living in godly contentment, who call themselves defying the word of God, who call themselves not honoring God and life is going so great, but what they don't understand, when you are doing that, you are self-engineering your poverty and you are going nowhere fast because you can hold on to money and still be worried. You can hold on to money and still be toiling. You can hold on to money and still be fearful that the job is going to let you go. You can hold on to money and still be fearful that you're going you, 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 to get laid off. Why? Because money has become your God. And don't allow that to happen. We want godly contentment reigning and ruling in our lives. Amen? Let's go to Psalms 23. Psalms 23. Glory to God. Psalms 23. <clears throat> I'm going to read verse 1 here, and I really want you to pay attention. Pay attention. Let me get this ready for me in the NLT, the TPT, in the ERV. <laughs> David, one of the things, well, let's just read it. David said, the Lord is my shepherd. Think about this now. now think about contentment. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. What is David saying? The reason I can say the Lord is my, my shepherd, the reason I can live in godly contentment, what is he saying? Because I'm sure of the outcome with God. The reason I can say the Lord is my shep shepherd and I sh watch the outcome, I shall not want. David is saying, my protection, my provision, and my guidance is in the Lord, and therefore, I shall not want. What is this scripture telling us? Godly contentment. When we live in godly contentment, godly contentment produces a surety of the outcome. That's how you can live in peace. That's how you can live uh, not worrying about bills. That's how you can live not worrying about what your children are going to do and what they're not going to do. That's how you can live not worrying about what your job is going to do, what this stock is going to do, what this dividend is going to do. Well, how, how, how can I live like that? You can live knowing you got to be, you got to know that the Lord is your shepherd, your provision, your protector. And when you know that, you can boldly state, I shall not want. 
How can you say that? Look, I, I know God's provision over my life. I know God's protection over my life. I know God's guidance over my life. He leads me and guides me. And I know that God will not leave me, nor will he forsake me. That's how I can live in godly contentment. But here's what I do know. I won't be in want because of those things. See, godly contentment, when you live in godly contentment, you have a surety of the outcome. So that dispels the myth that your career is going to give you a, a, a sure outcome. You can't, you can't put your contentment in that. You can't put your peace in that. Why? You can't be sure of the outcome. One day they want you, the next day they don't. One day your career's on fire, in five years it's nothing. One day you're doing X, Y, and Z, and in five years they changed it. Listen, you, you, you're not sure of the outcome. The Lord is your shepherd and you shall not want. See, that's a confession you need to make every single day. The Lord is your shepherd, you shall not want. Let's keep reading. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me. See, when you're sure of this, you're living in godly contentment. My Lord leads me beside still water. Still water is peace, inner peace. My Lord leads me, not my ambition. Not, I remember when I was a you know, young man, I used to tell my wife, she was at home with Zaria. I used to tell her, I'm out here working hard for you. Such an erroneous statement for, 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 for a husband or a wife. I'm out here doing this for you. My God, I left, I, I left on Friday. I was in Mississippi. I was in Mississippi, went to St. Louis, went to Kansas City, went to Detroit, went to Chicago, come down to Baltimore, come down to Greenland, South Carolina, come back over to, 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 to Atlanta. And I did all of this in a span of five to seven days doing meetings all over the country. And I would say, I'm doing this for you so that you don't have to in 10 years not realizing I'm not her God. Such an erroneous statement. No, I need you to hear from God, Z. So I don't want to make the statement or give you the illusion that in five years, everything is going to be secure. Give you the illusion that in 10 years, everything is going to be financially stable. And you stop hearing from God for yourself and for us. Why? Because you've got to be content. I can't give you contentment by promising a future to you. Listen, the Lord is your shepherd, Z, and you shall not want. The Lord is leading you. And he sure did. Because he, the, Lord, the Lord was speaking to my wife. She said, look, we're going to take Zari out of private school, and I'm going to work. I said, oh, 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 okay, oh, okay. All right, we're going to do that. What was she saying? I've been seeking God. I've been seeking God. And there's no amount of parenting I can do that's going to prevent her from having to believe God for herself. But God is speaking to me. And I'm not going to muzzle that, Derek, with the idea that you got the whole future secured. Young man at that time, didn't know what I was saying, got born again, all this kind of stuff, working hard. And, 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 and my allegiance to her was, you won't have to do X, Y, Z. I'm doing this for you. And guess what? That was wrong. Why? It shut down her living in godly contentment. It shut down her hearing from God. It shut down her being led by God. Why? Because we want, we, we want godly contentment in our households. We want our spouses to have contentment from God, not from us. And David is saying, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. And the reason a lot of marriages fail later on, 20, 25 years, is because the husband or the wife wakes up and realizes, you've been my God all my life. But the Holy Spirit has been muzzled because you promised me something. And I shouldn't have went with that. I should have went with contentment and peace through God, through God. So let's keep reading. He says, he says, my still waters, verse 3, he restores my soul. See, contentment means, contentment means God has reset the factory settings on your soul. You are content with your inner man, with who you are. So you don't need a certain title to feel good about yourself. You don't need a certain position to feel good about yourself. You don't need a certain house to feel good about yourself. You don't need a certain car to feel good about yourself. Why? Because the Lord has restored your soul. And when the Lord restores our soul, you can assure yourself that you're going to have godly contentment. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake, for his purpose. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil. Look at that peace. For you are with me. See, we understand that God is with us. Godly contentment is inevitable. When you, think, when you think that God is not with you, you try to prosper by the strength of your hand. 
You, you may do what I did. You may manipulate your spouse into thinking everything is under control as long as you stay at bay. Everything is under control as long as you stay here. And God is like, I need, Derek, I need you to get out of the way <laughs> of your wife hearing from me and let her hear from me. And if I tell her to do X, Y, and Z, I need you to partner with that the same way she partnered with you going all over the country with this sales stuff. I need you to do that. This is not a one-way street. Godly contentment's got to be in you, and godly contentment's got to be in her. But if you muzzle the Holy Spirit on her by telling her everything's going to be okay, you don't have to, and the Holy Spirit is saying you need to, it's going to be a sad day in the years to come for her or him. And David has given us a picture of how to do this. He says, I fear no evil. You are with me. Thy rod and thy staff. Watch this now. They comfort me. That's godly contentment. See, God's rod and his staff is constant. It's, it's, it's constant. So you can rest assured that you're going to have godly contentment. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Let God fight your battles. The way God handles your enemies is he prospers you in front of them. The way God deals with your enemies is he prospers you in front of them. Therefore, you just remain content. You don't have to go out and get a PhD when they get one. You don't have to go out and buy a house when they buy one. You don't have to go out and prove them wrong. You don't have to start the, you don't have to start the business to prove them wrong. You don't have to buy this or buy that or be this or be that to prove them wrong. God says, listen, when, 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 when you're in godly contentment with me, when you're resting your soul in me, when I'm restoring your soul, when I'm bringing peace into your life, listen, I will prosper you in front of your enemies. Don't argue with them. I will prosper you in front of your bitter ex-wife. I will prosper you in front of your bitter ex-husband. But you know what some, most people do? They prosper, po post on, on Facebook to show their ex-wife, to show their ex-husband just how good they're doing. And guess what? That's not godly contentment at all. Godly contentment is I'm going to live in God. I'm going to live for God. I'm going to give to God. I'm going to grow spiritually in God. And God is going to prosper me in front of your harsh, bitter words. God is going to prosper me in front of your harsh, bitter rumors. That's what godly contentment does. Let's keep going. You prepare a table for me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head. God anoints you to live this godly contentment, to live in godly contentment. You anoint my head with all. Watch this. And I don't have to fight for prosperity. Why? Because when I'm anointed by God and I'm living in this godly contentment, listen, things are spilling over. You have, you, you, you have, you have a life of extra. You have a life of aboveness. That's why you want to employ this godly contentment and not ambition. Ambition gets you in trouble and not performance. A desire to be known, a desire to be somebody, it gets you in trouble because life, the vicissitudes of life will batter you around. Unpredictable change. Listen, careers are shutting down due to this COVID-19. Companies are folding due to this COVID-19. And you couldn't have told some employees that five years ago because all of their promises of a good future, of a good retirement, was honed into this company. And that's the wrong way to live. You put your confidence in God, not in man. He says, my cup runneth over. And surely, watch this now, when you live in godly contentment, surely goodness and mercy, watch this, you don't chase God. Stop saying that. Goodly, goodness and mercy shall follow you all the days of your life, not just when you're a teenager, not just when you go to college, not just when you have your first kid and you have to stay home from work for a year, not when you have your second kid and you may stay home to work for three years. By the time you get to your third kid, if you allow that goodness and mercy follows you, you can say, you know what? I stayed at home for kid one. I stayed at home for kid two. But you know what? I'm kid three. I'm having it and I'm moving where God wants me to move. Why? Because I know I'm not chasing God. Goodness and mercy, when living in godly contentment, it follows me. It, 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 it follows me. Listen, God's goodness and mercy follows you. That should give you tremendous contentment in your life. That should give you tremendous peace in your life. And listen, you're not reaching for things to amplify who you are. 
You're speaking things and testifying of things to amplify who he is. You spend more time doing that. You know, a lot of believers start prospering and they start doing this stuff. They get secluded. They stop giving. They stop hanging around. They, 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 they stop looking, looking down and bringing people up. They stop all of the things that they did to get them there. <laughs> Think about that, what's happening. They abandoned, they abandoned the contentment, the godly contentment. And the word says godliness and contentment is great gain. They abandoned that, and now their confidence is in them. Now they really can't do X, Y, and Z. Now they don't have time for God. Now they don't have time to serve, so on and so forth. What's happening? You've replaced your contentment with your performance, and the word tells us what happens with that. Riches will take, grow wings and fly away. Hallelujah. Let's, let's look at this real quick, media, in the uh, NLT. The Lord is my shepherd. I have all that I need. Now just pause right there. I have all that I need. Do you have transportation? Yeah. Do you have bread? Yeah. Do you have clothes, Raymond? Yeah. You have all you need. You have all you need. I have all I need. And in order to live in godly contentment, you got to book in your life right here at Psalms 23, verse 1. The Lord is my shepherd. I have all that I need. Remember, godly contentment is when we have surety of the outcome. David says, I shall not want. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. The Lord watches over me. I shall not want. The Lord leads me. I shall not want. The Lord restores my soul. I, I, I shall not want. The, 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 the Lord prepares a table in front of my enemies. I shall not want. I don't have to reach. I don't have to manipulate. I don't have to go in debt to show the, the, the Lord is my shepherd. He says, the Lord is my shepherd. I have all that I need. Next verse. He lets me rest in green meadows. He leads me beside peaceful streams. He renews my strength. He guides me along right paths, bringing honor to his name. Notice God, when God infuses us with strength, with business acumen, with intelligence, with know-how, not for us to be seen, for him to be glorified. And if you're starting any business, any, any, any business, uh, any self-employed business, any, any uh, entrepreneur business, any, any, any podcast, any YouTube channel, writing any book, anything, if you're doing it to glorify you and not God, that's wrong as a believer. You got to rewrite your mission statement. Your thing needs to bring people closer to God. Your thing needs to glorify God. Well, how in the world can cutting grass glorify God? God, how in the world is that? Just make sure as you're giving your testimony, just make sure as you're saying how good your business is doing, don't be afraid to tell your customer whose you are. You are the Lord's. And, and, and the reason I'm so good at what I do, uh, Mr., Mr. John, is because I serve God and I honor God. And, and, and God has allowed me to do this, and I'm grateful to God for that. Don't just, don't just boast in your great service. Don't just boast in your great job and you take all the credit. He says, no, if he renews my strength, he guides me along the right path. Bringing honor to his name. Bring honor to God's name as he's advancing you, not your own. Next verse. Even when I walk through the darkest valley, listen, life, life can get dark. Life can get rough. Marriage can get rough. Life can get rough as a teenager, but you got to know this. If you're living in godly contentment, you know the surety of the outcome. God is going to come through. God is going to give you a word in that, in that, in that dark time. God is going to give you a word if that company lays you off. God is going to give you a word when you're about to divorce your wife. God is going to give you a word when you're, about to lie, you're lying to your parents. God's going to give you a word. Listen, in the darkest time, he says, through the darkest valley, listen, he says, I won't be afraid. For you are close beside me. See, the proximity of God should give us godly contentment. The surety of the proximity of God in our lives, in our marriage, in our finances, in our business, it should give us godly contentment. Your rod and your staff, they protect me and comfort me. Remember, the Lord is my shepherd. He protects and he comforts me. Therefore, I shall not want. Next verse. You prepare a feast for me in the presence of my enemies. You honor me. Watch this. Look at how God honors us. You honor me by placing the anointing on my life. The anointing to what? To advance 
and glorify my name. The anointing to what? To increase and glorify my name. The anointing to what? To be an awesome husband in contentment. To be an awesome spouse in contentment. To be an awesome child in godly contentment. Is Listen, you want to be anointed, not talented. You want to be anointed. See, anointing, the anointing can remove burdens and destroy yokes. Talent can't do that. Matter of fact, talent can only take you so far. You want to be anointed. Why do you want to be anointed as an engineer? Because when you're anointed as an engineer, you got book smarts, then you got God on top of that. You got what the books did not teach you, then you got God teaching you on top of that. You got what your mentor is not teaching you, and you got what God is teaching you on top of that. Listen, for godly contentment, you got to receive the anointing of God on your life. Next verse. He says, my cup overflows, not with things, blessings. See, godly contentment brings blessings, not things. See, when we're not living in godly contentment, we purchase things to try to, 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 try to, to, try to convince ourselves that we're living in the peace of God. We, we, we buy things. This is David said, no, my cup overflows with blessings. Blessings come from God. Things can come from us. Blessings come from God. The goodness of the Lord, the goodness of the Lord should bring godly contentment. The goodness of the Lord also brings a man to repentance. The blessings, we're anointed to be blessed. We're anointed to walk in the blessings of God. But if you don't, if you don't receive this, you will purchase things and call it anointed and be in debt. Nope, we're living in godly contentment. We're living in godly contentment. I say, I say, we're living in godly contentment. Let's, let's read this real quick in the, uh, 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 the Passage Translation. The Lord's my shepherd, my best friend. The Lord's my best friend and my shepherd. I always have more than enough. Good God Almighty. I always have more than enough. You'll always have more than enough. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. You should say that out loud. I'll always have more than enough. Why? Because the Lord is my shepherd. You are sure of the outcome when you're quoting Psalms 23 verse 1. Why? Because the Lord is your shepherd. And you, sh- and you are so sure of that outcome, you can make this statement right here. I'll always have enough. Next verse. He offers a resting place for me in his luxurious love. Think about that. His tracks, his tracks take me to an oasis of peace, the quiet brook of bliss. Next verse. That's where he restores and revives my life. See, this godly contentment, I'm here to tell you, once you start to live in this thing and understand spending time with God, look, it's going gonna, it's gonna to restore your soul. It's going to revive your life. So you don't need a new car to revive your life. Watch this. You don't need a new child in the house to revive your life. Why? God is so good. You're living in such a level of godly contentment. He says, listen, when this happens, I restore your life and I revive your life. He opens before me pathways to God's pleasure. Woo! Woo! Glory to God. And leads me along his footsteps of righteousness. Next verse. So that I can bring honor. Again, here it is again. Godly contentment brings honor to God, not us. Godly contentment brings honor to God, not us. We, get, we have to know, God, you're driving this ship. I'm hearing from you, and I'm moving. I'm prospering in you, and I'm giving. Promotion comes from, doesn't come from the north, south, east, and west. I know it comes from the Lord. Therefore, I'm moving in you. He says, look, so that we bring honor to God. Do you know how powerful it is to get a promotion, to increase in income, and honor God? Now, I know some people, if they're making $4,000 a month and they get a raise for $5,000 a month, I know some people look at Psalms, Psalms 3 and go, listen, I got to give the first fruits of my increase, which is $1,000. I was at $4,000. I got a raise. I'm at five. God, I'm, I'm going to honor you with my first fruits. And the word says when you do that with your first fruits, the lump will be blessed. Everything else behind it is going to be blessed. Some people will take that 1000 and and they will honor God with it. And not even blink twice. Why? Because they know God is their source. And God brought them that promotion. God pressed upon man's heart to give that raise. And guess what? They take it and they, and, 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 and they honor God with it. Next verse. 
<clears throat> Lord, even when your path takes me through of the valley of the deepest darkness, fear will never conquer me. Think about this godly contentment. When you live in godly contentment, fear can't conquer you. You know, fear, the economy can't bully you. A relationship can't bully you. You know, the devil can't bully you. You'll never be this. You'll never be that. You're wasting your time. He can't do it. Fear can't conquer you when you live in godly contentment. Next verse. For you already have, you remain close to me and lead me through it all the way. Next verse. Your authority is my strength and my peace. The comfort of your love takes me, takes away my fear. L l here's one thing I know about being a husband. There's only so much I can do to put my wife at peace. She's got to have a revelation of God's love for her to really put her at peace. And you know what I like to do? Stay out of his way. That's why I'm not going to make promises for the future. That's why I'm not going to tell next year you ain't going to be doing this or, you know, you know, in six months, just, 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 no, 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 no. In six months, I need you to keep believing God. In six months, I need you to have mastered godly contentment, which she's mastered godly contentment more than I have and longer than I have. She, he, listen, I hear from God. She hears from God. But I know when my wife says, I feel like the Lord is saying, I, I know without a shadow of a doubt, she spends time with God. I know without a shadow of a doubt, she's not chasing the wind. She's not trying to impress nobody. I know without a shadow of doubt, she pursues wholeness of soul. And when she says that, I know it's coming from a wife who's content with our lives, content with where God has given us, where God has taken us, and where God has us. But, 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 but God is saying, do this now. The comfort of your love takes away your fear. No, whoa, 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 whoa. I'll never be lonely uh, for you are near. Next verse. You become my delicious feast. Even when my enemies dare to fight, you anoint me with the fragrance of your Holy Spirit. Glory to God. Next verse. You give me, you give me all I can drink of you until my heart overflows. Boy, I'm telling you, when God gives you all that you can handle, you're living in godly contentment. Let's see it in the, uh, the next translation, please. The Lord is my shepherd. <coughs> Somebody said, what translation is that? This is the message. Uh, uh, this is not ERB. The easy to read translation. The Lord is my shepherd. I will always have everything I need. He gives me green pastures to lie in. He leads me by cool pools of water, calm pools of water. He restores my strength. He leads me on right paths to show that he is good. God is not trying to, when you're hearing from God and God is saying do this and do that, when God is saying no, don't give this, give that, he's trying to show you on that path that he's good. That's why automatic tithing can be dangerous because God says, listen, I know you got to set 4,000 a month. I'm telling you 14 this month. I know you got to set for $1,000 a month. I'm telling you, you get $500 right now. I know you got to set for, for $75 a month. I'm telling you, $500 right now. What is that? He restores my strength. He leads me on the right path to show that he is good. So when God is speaking to us, it, 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 to, 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 he's speaking to us to say, do this, do that. Not What he's saying is, you, you, you're in godly contentment. This is great gain, what I'm telling you. This is great gain, what I'm whispering to you. And I know it may take this down or that down, but I'm trying to lead you into the way you should go. And godly contentment does not come from us. It comes from God. Next verse. Even when I walk through a valley, of dark, a valley as dark as the grave, I will not be afraid of any danger because you are with me. Your rod and staff, they comfort me. You prepare a meal for me in, the front, in, in front of my enemies. You welcome me as an honored guest. My cup is full and spilling over. Your goodness and your mercy will be with me all my life, and I will live in the Lord's house a long, long, long time. In your notes. Thought number one, godly contentment. It's not a state of, account, state of account. It's a state of heart. Godly contentment, it's not a state of an account, state of account. It's a state of heart. It's got to come in here. It doesn't come out here. It doesn't come with balances. It doesn't come with how many children we have. It doesn't come with how good our wife is to us. It doesn't come with how good our husband is to us. It doesn't come with how blessed our kids. It, 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 godly contentment, it's not a state of account. It's a state of heart. It's got to come from within. Listen, you have to know this. Your husband can't know this for you. Your wife can't know this for you. Your children can't know this for you. You can't know it for your children. Godly contentment is a state of heart. It's a heart thing where God has moved in and he has full persuasion over your life. And you can boldly state like David did, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. 
when I thought they laid off uh, uh, the fifth floor. Listen, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Well, come wintertime, the season slows down. You know, my work slows down. Listen, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. I'm just saying, you know, people are cutting back. I don't know if they're going to cut back your service. Oh, boy, hey, they cut back fine. But here's what I know. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. And the only way you can keep confessing that in the midst of decline, natural decline is, is here. Because if you look at the state of account, you may look at your bank account. You may look at your client list and go, my God, what, what is going on? And get into ter- to toiling and worrying. But the only way you can say the Lord is my shepherd and I shall not want is, is and, and, and really mean it, it comes from your heart. Somebody said, I don't know if I can do that. Sometimes, l- let me give you an exercise right here on this TV. You want godly contentment. You want to know that God is God in your life. I tell you, I, I dare you to pray this. Lord, What would you have me to give? I dare you to say that. What would you have me to release? Because I tell you what, I need to get rid of the state of accounts that's telling me that I'm okay. I I, I need to dispel those. What what is it? He he may say, come back off that overtime. You don't need the extra money. He he may say, you know what? You're going to school to get your master's for you to feel good. You really don't need them. It's only going to add $2,000, two to $5,000 to your bottom line. It's cost you $85,000 to get them. What are you even doing? What are you even thinking about? Matter of fact, some people on the job are going to make more than you without a degree because they know what they're doing, and they've been doing it a long time. So, 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 so why do you got to do that? Listen, I dare you to tell the state of accounts, listen, you're not my God. God is my God, and it comes from your heart. That's why I says it. When you give, give cheerfully. Make sure it comes from your heart. If you don't give grudgingly, why? You give grudgingly because now it's about to affect your account. Now it's about to affect your vacation. That's when you give grudgingly. No, it has to come from the heart. Point number two. Contentment is available to us, to all of us, by the way we construct and maintain our own internal landscape. Contentment is available to all of us by the way we construct We construct our spirit man with prayer, surety of the outcome, and maintain our own internal, it's a hard issue, spiritual landscape. You spend time with God. You pray to your God. You give back to your God. What are you doing? You are constructing your own internal landscape of this godly contentment. You are constructing your own internal landscape that God is your source. You, 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 you're not, it's not out of works. It's out of your heart. I'm giving. I'm constructing. I'm giving back. I'm constructing my internal landscape. I'm turning it over to God. I'm constructing my internal landscape. Turn it over to God. Yeah, the word says, cast your cares over on God. What are you doing when you do that? God, this is too big for me. If I get involved with this, I'm going to start manipulating, lying, gossiping, get in anger, all this kind of stuff. I'm not going to get involved in that. You, listen, listen, prepare the table for me. I receive that. Anoint me. I receive that. So if they take this away, I'm still going to increase. Listen, you, you, you got to construct your internal landscape with prayer, confession, spending time with God. Had a, 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 fr- a friend of mine uh, in, in, in ministry here, works here at the church, came by the house uh, <clears throat> this week, so on and so forth. And, 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 and he came by the house. I was in the back. I thought he was going to come from the left side. He came from the right side. He said, hey, pastor, what's going on? Terrified me because I'm looking over this way. But I tell you what I was doing. I was constructing my internal landscape. I had that word right in my hand. I was reading that word in the morning. I was reading that word, reading God's word, allowing it to construct my internal landscape, allowing it to deal with my heart concerning God, allowing it to, to, to implant God as my source in me. And you can't say God is your source if you're not putting God in. You can't say I have godly contentment if you're not putting God in. That's just, that's just, that's just a scripture quoter, but, but they don't have it in their heart. See, when you get it in your, you, when you get it in your heart, you, 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 constructed that, you, you constructed that internal landscape. You had something to do that. You did John 15. You meditated in the word day and night. You spent time with God. You released back towards God. You detached from, from, from the God of this world, which is money, and you told God, you're higher. You did that. And when you're doing that, you're constructing your internal spiritual landscape to say, you know what? I live in godly contentment. 
And these are things I do every day to know that I'm content with what God is doing in my life. Point number three. Godly contentment is found in making the most of the least. Let me say that again. Godly contentment is found in making the most of the least. I only got a one-bedroom apartment. Well, don't let your ears and your eyes start wondering because your friend just got a house. Make the most of that one-bedroom. Well, I only, I only got a car. I mean, I, that, that's all I got. Well, 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 I tell you what, don't let your ears start wondering over there. Don't let your eyes start wondering over there. Listen, make the most of what God has blessed you with. I'm going to go out here and I'm going I'm, I'm, I'm gonna, to I'm gonna make more money. Listen, it is an oxymoron to pursue more money and you can't manage what you have. More money does not fix your internal landscape. More increase does not fix your inability to manage money. You got to manage money. You got to make the most of the least. So in other words, you got to master where you are and you master where you are by living in godly contentment, knowing that, that you shall not want. But if you can't budget the 2000 you won't budget the 6000 What will happen is you have bigger bills, more responsibilities, and they take things quicker when you buy bigger things. They come get them quicker. Why? Because they just called a note on it. Say, you know what? Call a note on that $600,000 house. It's ours anyway. Go ahead and call it. Well, what in the world are you doing in a $600,000 house? What in the world are you doing spending 60% of your income paying this mortgage? What are you even thinking about? I tell you what's happening. I tell you what's happening. Things has replaced your contentment. And boy, it feels good. It feels good to ride good. It feels good to live big. But I tell you what, if living big is causing you to having to get up every single morning and hit that pavement like your hair is on fire, you're living a little bit too big. Why? Because you're not inspired to go to work. Your expenses are telling you go to work. There's a difference. Next thought. In order, to live in, in order to live in godly contentment, master the art of seeing God as your source, not as your bailout. Now, I may get in trouble for this with some Christians. You know, listen to me. Math is not a miracle. Math, it, it doesn't take a miracle to pay your car note. It shouldn't. It shouldn't take a miracle to pay your JA bill, your, your, your electric bill. It shouldn't take a miracle to pay your rent. It shouldn't take a miracle to pay your mortgage. It shouldn't take a miracle. What, what should it take? If you're living in godly contentment and you haven't overextended yourself, it should take $1,000, 250 every seven days. That's not a miracle. But when you start needing miracles for a dishonor of math, you're living for things not out of godly contentment. You got, th- you, you, you got too big of a car, too big of a house. You, 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 you put them in private school and you can't afford it. Why? Now you need a miracle for God to come through. And I'm not saying God won't come through. But listen, as believers, we got to start honoring math and God. We got to start honoring God and math. And if you honor math, miracle, listen, we need a miracle for healings. We need a miracle for tumors. We need a miracle. uh, 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 You don't need a miracle for a job promotion. You just want to open door that God opens. We need a miracle to to, to heal heal, heal us of asthma. We need a miracle to heal us of sickness. We need a miracle to heal our migraine headaches. That's what you need a miracle for. But we should never need a miracle for math. It's very simple. We interrupt or disrupt our contentment as believers when we dishonor math. When we dishonor math as believers, we start looking at God. Bail me out, God. And every 30 days you need a bailout, you got too much car. Every 30 days you need a bailout, you got too much house. Why? Why do you need that? Because you're not living in godly contentment and it wasn't great gain. You're living in, let me show people what I'm doing. Whenever you got to advertise a blessing, you ain't blessed. See, the blessing overtakes you. Goodness and mercy, it just follows you. But you start trying to finance your blessing, you will get, you, you get in over your head, man. Don't do it. And as believers, we are known to beg. I'm talking beg. For our needs and by our wants. We're known for it. So the church has got to bail us out. Uncle has got to bail us out. Our kids have to bail us out. Mama's got to bail us out. And nothing wrong with that. You, you got to help people. You know, I'm not saying times don't get rough. I'm not saying you need a little helping hand every now and then. But let me tell you something. If you violated math as a believer and you need a bailout 
every 30 days on something? I, I, I tell you what you need to do. Don't ask for a bailout. You bail out. Are you saying take the car back? You can't afford it. It's going to mess my credit up. Well, you're messing somebody else's bank account up by getting $300 a month from them on something that you can't afford. So we got to stop seeing God as a bailout and honor his math, honor living in godly contentment. So guess what? You got a one-bedroom, you're a single lady, you got a good job, you, you, you know, you, you're living in a safe, stable, and secure environment, and your friend decides to go get a master's. God didn't tell you to do that. You stay right where you're at. You have zero debt, you stay right where you're at. Why? you got to live in godly contentment concerning that situation. If you hop out there and go and try to get that master's and get it, and they're going to call for the note on that master's and say, hey, we need 900 bucks a month for you to pay for this uh, degree here. 900 bucks a month? Uh, Dad, is there any way I can get $500 from you this month? And Dad goes, sure, I, I got you, sweetheart. Next month, Dad, is there any way I can get five? My God, what has happened now? You dishonored math. You violated the contentment law, and you went and, you went and did a thing without consulting God. And when we go do things without consulting God, it disrupts our contentment in him. Amen? Next thought. Getting more things, getting more things won't make us happy, but giving will. Getting more things won't make us happy, but giving more will. Say, asking for my money, that's between you and God. One thing I know right now about COVID-19, you can't blame nothing else on no pastor. You can't blame nothing else on no church. Why? It's you and God. It's you and God. It's your personal time with God now. There is no serving in church. Are you serving at home? There is no serving in church. Are you serving your parents at home? There is no serving in church. Are you serving your husband at home? There is no serving in church. Are you serving your wife at home? You're not coming to intercessor prayer. We got prayer on Monday. We got prayer on Friday. But are you praying daily to your God? See, there's no more blame in church for nothing. Why? Because, because God has put us in a season where, not that God's put the COVID-19 on us, but we're in this season with God where it's just us and him. And you got seven days to think about how you're going to honor God. You got seven days to think about how you're going to honor God financially, how you're going to honor God with your, with, with your giving, how you're going to honor God with your kindness, how you're going to honor God by calling somebody up, texting somebody. And care. You, got, you got seven days to think about. As a matter of fact, we, we bark about prayer being in school, but how many times have you led your children in prayer? Well, I lead them in their lessons first. No, no wrong. Lead them in prayer first. Teach them to seek God first. Remember, remember, you want them anointed and smart. Because I've seen some smart people stay broke. I seen smart people that live a life of hysteria. They're on pins and needles. I seen some smart kids, some smart guys. Listen, <laughs> I know some smart guys, but man, they are so afraid to mess up. They are so afraid to miss it. Their life is it's, it's always tense. Why? Because they bought into smart not being anointed. And don't do that. Don't do it. You want to be smart and anointed. You want to be smart with a relationship with God. You want to be smart with a prayer life. But smart without those things, you abandon godly contentment. And we're not here to do that. Amen? So I want to reread that thought to you. Getting more things won't make you happy. Giving more will. I don't Who in the world said that? Well, Paul said it in Acts, but he was quoting Jesus. Acts 20, verse 35, he said, hey, hey, it's more blessed to give than it is to receive. It's more blessed to release. It's more blessed to release than it is to receive. It's more blessed to honor God off $10,000 a month than it is to receive the $10,000 a month and don't honor him. Remember, two of the greatest things you can be doing, growing in God and giving. Growing in God and giving. Giving keeps self down. Giving keeps me from thinking I'm God. Giving keeps my career from thinking it's my God. Giving keeps my business from thinking it's my God. The two greatest things a believer can be doing to maintain and live in this godly contentment is giving and growing spiritually in God. Next thought. Godly contentment, we're going to move over to your soul now. David says, prepare a table for me in the presence of my enemies. Godly contentment is feeling good about ourselves with unconditional self-acceptance. Did you catch that? God made you, he wonderfully made you, beautifully made you, 
And here's what you got to do to live in the godly contentment. It's feeling good about yourself with unconditional self-acceptance. Well, I got freckles. Learn how to accept it. Learn how to accept it. I don't like the way my nose is. Learn how to accept it. You got to accept that. Because if you don't accept it, you're going to hop over here to plastic surgery. You're going to try to hide it. I I really don't like my legs. Well, my God, God gave you the legs. You got to learn to accept them. You got to learn to accept them. And and, and I want to say this. I want to say this to anybody struggling with self-image. Why are you so afraid to walk by faith in that area? Why are you so afraid to show your arms? Why are you so afraid to show your legs? You walk by faith in everything else. I'll tell you why. Because you haven't accepted you. You've accepted you and what's wrong with your legs. And it's like, uh, the problem with that is you accept you and what's wrong with them, not your legs. You got to accept you and your legs. These are my legs. And here's, and here's the deal with them. If, if, it's, if it's veins, varicose veins, if it's, if it's, listen, when I was small, I had what they call infotigo. And if a mosquito bit me, it was like, oh, we got some good blood here. And they, they called their posse. And, and next thing I know, I got 25 bites. Now, what I didn't understand was back then when I scratched, I created scars. Man, it took 10, 15 years with cocoa butter and everything else and, and just, 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 just taking the right wellness supp- supplements for those scars to go away. But I remember when I was 13, 14, 15, 16, said, and, and guys would go, my God, what happened to your legs, man? I was like, man, you know I got this thing. And before there was long shorts, I had long shorts. I, I had long shorts. I, I bought a double X. Why? I was trying to hide what I hadn't accepted. And that's not godly contentment. That's not godly contentment. Listen, my wife works out radically. She lifts weights. She squats. She, she's in the kitchen doing squats. She, she's brushing her teeth doing lunges. She, 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 I mean, she is just exercising her heart everywhere she goes. And I always tell her, hey, you fine as wine. You fine, fit, and trim. You, boy, I'm telling you, you are long, lean, and luscious. I call it kind of tall, yes, y'all. But you know what? I can say all of that. But until she accepted herself, she's not content with herself. I don't know why I'm on this. Do you know one of the greatest aggravators to wives being comfortable with their body is their husbands? It's their husbands. How can you say that? She couldn't even live in contentment, godly contentment in that area because of me. Oh, hey, we're going to go to the beach. Oh, that may be too short now. Oh, 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 whoa, 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 whoa. You make, you know, hey, I'm, I'm, and she's not dressing like she's, she, you, know, you, you know, she's in a doggone uh, uh, booty video. She's not dressing like that. Yeah, I did say that for your mind to just to be plain, make, make it plain to you. She's not dressing like that. But I was an instrument of agitation to her. And, and, it, but now I'm like, go for it. Shoot, go for it. I mean, go for it. It's a bathing suit, two-piece, go for it. My God, the other women out here can't even touch you on this resort. Walking by faith and sight. I mean, stuff, dimples and ripples are everywhere. But guess what? They've accepted themselves. They've accepted how God has made them. And it's time out for believers. Believers not walking in this, in this contentment in the area of their image. I don't get it. You can have faith in everything else except that. No, listen to me. God and contentment is feeling good about ourselves with unconditional self-acceptance. I mean, if God can, God, Moses said, God, what should I tell him? Tell him I am that I am, said it. I'm confident in who I am. Just, 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 just tell him now. We got to be the same way. We got to be the same. Look, this is how God made me. This is the color of my skin. This is my head. This is my nose. These are my lips. Listen, I had three of your big head kids. That's why I got these doggone stress marks. That's why I had to, I had to get a C-section because of this second. That's why my stomach is this way. But guess what? You can't look at that and go, ooh, ooh. And if truth be told, most husbands get uncomfortable, not with their wife's body, uncomfortable with what other people are saying about their wife's body. And husband, we got to fall in line too. Because she wants you to get in some Speedos. She wants you to get in a bike of shorts. She wants you to, you know, kind of take your shirt off every now and then and, and show what's going on. The, 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 they walk in so much grace towards us. 
And all we try to do is tell them how to dress, what to dress, what to wear. That's too short. That's too tight. This, 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 this. And what you're doing is you're promoting her fear. You're promoting her discontent with her body. And we got to stop doing that. We got to just tell our wives, sweetheart, go for it. We're on the beach, go for it. But guess what? She has got to be. She has to have self-acceptance in order to go for it. Why? Because if you got kids, if you got daughters, if you got sons, and they're watching you be in bondage to something, nine times out of ten, you're placing the same bondage on them. Why? Because there's something about you that you're not comfortable with. And you'll live your whole life, you'll go to 25 resorts and never, ever enjoy them fully because you're so conscious of your body. My thing is, if you don't like the weight, do something about it. Just do something about it. And, and, and go and live your life. Amen? Let me get back over here. You can't storm it through the TV. <clears throat> next, n- next point. Hallelujah. Discontentment is inevitable when we replace God with us. You want to get discontent? Replace God with you. Paul says, listen, uh, I... <laughs> I got some self-confidence here. I can do. Do what? All. All what? Things. How do you do that? Through Christ that does what? He infuses me with strength. Paul says, that's how I can say that. That's how I can say that. What was Paul saying? He says, look, if Paul would have said, I can do all things through myself, he would place God with him. He said, no, I can do all things through Christ that strengthens me. We get very discontent when we replace us, when we replace God with us. Very discontent. When we're the sole money managers of our money and God has nothing to do with it, you're going to be discontent. You're going to have money in the bank and you still can't enjoy it. There's a reason for that. Why? You've taken God out of the equation and you put yourself there. And I can promise you this, that kind of living right there engineers poverty. You can't replace God. You've got to allow God to work through you to do things that you're called to do. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Next point. <clears throat> we need to learn to be realistic about ourselves. <laughs> to live in this God of contentment, we've got to be realistic about ourselves. Both our strengths and our weaknesses. You know, <clears throat> this brings tremendous godly contentment when we can learn to be realistic about ourselves. Listen, listen, mom. Listen, listen to me. Listen, listen to me. Get realistic about what you can and can't do. Parenting your children. Be realistic. Sometimes you're tired. Sometimes you got to say, you know what? Take a nap first, do your homework later. You got to be realistic about your strengths and your weaknesses to walk in this godly contentment. You know, if you're trying to be in sales to make more money, to buy more things, to look blessed, you're not being realistic. If you don't say two to three words to people, you're not a salesman. My gosh, <laughs> if you're an obscure, walk in a room, you're all obscure and you're, you're afraid to be out front, you're not a salesman. You, you're, you're not. I was telling the guy, I said, hey, you in business? He said, yeah. I said, you ever read any sales books? Uh, no. You ever took any classes on sales? Uh, no. You do realize you got to be realistic about that. You are in the sales business. No, nah, I do this. No, 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 no. <laughs> you're in the sales business. What am I selling? You and your product. And you want to know who make the most money in sales? The person who can sell themselves. Product second. Why? Because you become comfortable with me, product is nothing. When you become comfortable with me, guess what? You, you, you'll get the service. But if you don't know how to sell yourself, business is going to be short for you. And here's the thing about sales. When you don't know how to sell, when you don't follow up, when you don't know how to have custom, manage your customer retention, stay in contact with them, it gets harder every single month. Listen to me. We've got to be realistic about our strengths and our weaknesses. Listen, if you're going to be a leader, you better be content in God. 
Anybody that struggles with this right here, you struggle when people don't like you. You struggle when people criticize you. You're not ready to be a leader. You're not content in God. You're not stable in God enough to get out, put yourself out there, and people go, I don't like that. People go, book didn't make no sense to me. <laughs> you, 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 to live in this God of contentment, you, 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 you got to hear what I'm saying. If you're afraid of that, you haven't mastered godly contentment. Because when you master living in godly contentment, you know that God is with you. You know that you put your heart into it. And when they say things to you or about you, it doesn't place claws in your soul for weeks at a time, for days at a time. That's why you can't live for people. Saul tried to do it, and guess what? His kingdom got taken away from him and given to David because he got in people bondage. You can't do that. You, you, you can't do that. Listen, being realistic about your strengths and your weaknesses, and also we need to learn how to be realistic uh, 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 about, our, about ourselves, both in our strengths and our weaknesses, because we can't do everything, and we don't do everything well. We simply don't. I want to say this to you. As you master living in godly contentment, I want you to ask yourself this question. If you could start life back over as an 18-year-old, what would you be doing? When you answer that question, I guarantee you nine times out of ten, it's not what you're doing today. <laughs> Why? Because you've, you've grown to know yourself. You've grown to know your strengths. You've grown to know your weaknesses. And that's one of the things, that's one of the keys to godly contentment. Listen, listen, it, it, this may shock you. But it's very dangerous to your contentment when you say you love what you do. Because what you do could disappear. I, I, I love, you know, my wife, I, I, I love raising my kids. I, 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 I just love what I do. Uh, uh, they're going to be 18 and gone. Then what? Uh, they're going to be 12, and they're going to say, I, I want to spend time with kids in school. Then what? Because when you say you love what you do and God is not in that equation, listen, loving what you do is not a statement of a surety of the outcome. I love what God empowers me to do. I love what God leads me to do. I love what God is sustaining me to do. But I don't, when I say I love what I do, I put what I do into the place of God. And, that, and what I do can disappear at a heartbeat. Then what? I remember our kids went, Marvion Tate went off to college, and I asked my wife, I said, what? And she said this publicly, I said, what is wrong with you? What is going on? She said, I'm almost depressed. Why? Because because her instructions, her, her, her leading and guiding didn't have anywhere to land now. Now she's got to find herself. Now she's wondering, why, man, I should have went to school while he, when he was 12 years old. Man, man, I should have did X, Y, Z. And she went to school, got a degree and all that kind of stuff. But that's what happens. When you love what you do, you can't seek God on what you should be doing. When you say you love what you do, I know what you're trying to say, but you're placing that thing in the place of God, no, I love what God empowers me to do. I love what God leads me to do. I love what God blesses me to do. I, and that's what I love. Because when the blessing ain't on it, the thing that I do, it doesn't, it, it doesn't, it, it doesn't interrupt my, uh, uh, my countenance, my disposition, my contentment. Why? Because I know that God is still with me. I know that I shall not want. And when the thing that you say you love to do disappears, discontentment, man, will eat you alive. If your boss walked in Monday morning and said, you know what, I know you, you've been here 23 years, I know you're trying to make it to 30, but I tell you what we're going to do, we're going to retire you early, you have to the end of June to go ahead and get the paperwork together, and uh, we've got to make room for the new. Huh? Your five-year plan just went out the window. What you love, you, you, now all of a sudden, you, you, man, I don't waste my time. No, 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 no. You place it in the place of God, and we get discontent when we replace God with God us. <clears throat> Hallelujah. I'm going to read this to you, and we'll be done. Mm. Mm, mm, mm. Listen, one thing about godly contentment uh, as we close, we need to understand it. We need to embrace it. We need to ingest it. We need to appropriate it. 
We need to understand godly contentment. Embrace godly contentment. Ingest godly contentment. And appropriate it. See, I am highly content in my marriage. But there was a time in my marriage where we was in it for the kids. And it wasn't commitment. It was a life arrangement. Why? We're not content with one another. I'm just not content with this life. I'm just tense in this. I don't know why. You easily aggravate me. I don't know why. And we call it peace. And it's really not peace. It's a living arrangement. That's not godly contentment. Godly contentment is saying, you know what? Here's my weakness in this. Here's what I feel about this. You know, a husband can feel like, man, I'm, I feel like I'm, I'm supposed to be doing X. <laughs> a wife can feel like I'm supposed to be doing X. I, but I'm going to keep the peace in the house. No, you're keeping a living arrangement because it, it, it gnaws at you. God is constantly, the Holy Spirit is constantly just, just, just trying to move through you, but you fixed what you love to do. You fixed your life. It's, it's an arrangement now. No, 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 no. You got to leave room for God to move you to walk in this God. You got to appropriate it. You got to embrace it. You got to ingest it and say, am I really at peace? Am I really content? Or is this just an arrangement? Was I told to do this because this is going to be the outcome? Man, look, they told us, look, you put your kids in private school, so on and so forth, and I'm telling you at a young age, they're going to start X, Y, and Z. And that private school teacher came to us and said, do you know one thing about Marviante? I said, what? Uh, that guy can entertain himself with a piece of lint. He can't be still. He can't be quiet. He just can't be, he, he, he can't do it. And I'm like, my God, I thought private school would fix it. And, and now that I look back, no private school ain't going to fix it. God has got to deal with that. He's got to get content. And, and I asked him today, I said, hey, where are you going? I, I got to shoot over here. I got to shoot over here. Hey, 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 where, I, I gotta, hey can you help me? I, I can give you 15, but I, I, I got to. And, and, I, and I still see it today. And, and, and it's like, my gosh, he keeps moving around. Guess what? Guess what? Here's the thing about that. God fearfully and wonderfully made him, but he's mature now enough to be led by God, to be pulled back by God. But back then, I thought private school would fix it. Private school would fix it. One of the most powerful things we can do with our kids is not tell them what they're going to do when they're 18. What is the Lord saying to you about school? What is the Lord speaking to you about school? One of the most powerful things you can do with your husband, with your wife, what is the Lord speaking to you about your life? Listen, you can be honest. Because we're not fixed in no arrangement here. What is the Lord saying to you to do? Because that's what we want. That's what we want. Amen? So we got to appropriate it, embrace it, understand it, and ingest it. Contentment, godly contentment, is a sustained inner peace regardless of our circumstance. Godly contentment is a sustained, enduring Inner peace, regardless of our circumstances. Paul says, I'm up, I'm down. Doesn't matter. I'm in prison, I'm free. Doesn't matter. Here's something I learned, which tells me he never knew it. Which tells me it's tough. This contentment thing is tough, but we got to learn it. Selfishness, it, it, it comes naturally. But contentment, Paul says, I had to learn that. It's a sustained inner peace, regardless of the circumstance. Listen, let this interpretation of godly contentment be ever present in your mind. Let this interpretation, what interpretation? That godly contentment is a sustained inner peace regardless if my kids go off to college and call me once a month. I'm still sustained. Regardless if my kids call me from college year one and say, ah, this is not me. Guess what? My godly contentment I have a sustained inner peace regardless of the circumstance. Let this interpretation be ever present in your mind. Were you blessed by the word of God? I'm so glad you took time out to join us today. I'm so glad you're putting God first. I'm so glad that the word of God is the final authority in your house. 
I'm so glad that you have an understanding of God and godly contentment. I'm so glad that you're living in perfect peace. I'm just so glad that nothing else matters in your life but God. I'm so glad you're living your life that way. And XL Church, we are so blessed. We are so blessed. Generous members, generous single moms, generous grandpas, generous grandmothers, generous visitors, generous online members. You, 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 you guys, you guys, you, you have shown us 